Pops, welcome. I'm so glad you could join. Right on. Thanks for having me. I've been telling you about it. Yeah, for months now. So I'm glad to be here with you. Good, 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 good. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this session because I had you come present in my classroom when, when schools were still open uh, in person on this very topic about the movement against apartheid. And my students got so much from it. And so I wanted to make sure that all these educators and students here today we're transmitting these lessons that were so important. And, you know, internationalism and Pan-Africanism, these things have been so important to the Black freedom struggle. And, you know, some of the sessions that we have done throughout the year um, have touched on some of these issues, but maybe not fully in depth like we'll do today. You know, so we covered people like Paul Robeson who had a really important commitment to, to internationalism and, and um, uplifting the Black diaspora. So I wanted you to speak about the importance of, of understanding the Black diaspora and an international approach when we look to the Black freedom struggle. Yeah. So as you know, Jesse, I, you know, I grew up, I came of age in the 60s. And with that uh, came a real shift in consciousness. Uh, I was born colored and Negro. And uh, during that period of time, we became black. And to call somebody black at that period of time was an insult. It was fighting words. Uh, but we transformed ourselves into black people and, and, and saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And with that came a recognition of our African roots. Uh, and during that period of time in the 60s, the struggle against colonialism on the African continent and in the Caribbean was at a fever pitch. And so uh, those struggles began to inform who we were as young people uh, and began to seep into our consciousness that we were people of African descent and that it was something that we should be proud of. Uh, and, and some of the activism in the 60s and the 70s uh, with activists uh, connecting with liberation movements across the African continent and the Caribbean, bringing speakers from the ANC, from SWAPO in Namibia, from, from uh, MPLA and Angola, all of these liberation movements coming to the US uh, really began to change our consciousness about who we were uh, as people of African descent. And so uh, really understanding that the struggle against anti-Black racism, against white supremacy is an international system and that we needed to connect with our brothers and sisters on the African continent in the Caribbean and indeed throughout Europe where the struggle of Black people uh, was being uh, waged. Uh, so, so that uh, for me as a young man growing up was really critical for me to identify who I was in the world, not only just in this, in this country. Uh, and for folks like me, I know some of the folks that are in this session understand and went through the same thing that I went through. Right on. That must have been an incredible transformation. It, it's just hard for me to even wrap my head around the kind of <laughs> huge cultural shift that occurred in your generation. And I feel like we're beginning to see a new emergence of a radical struggle, but um, we'll get to that. I want to ask you now, beginning to more focus in on the topic for today about apartheid and if you could explain for folks how the South African apartheid system worked to oppress black people and even mixed race people and, and other, uh, other um, people of color. And also um, why did black people here in the US see similarities with our own system? 
Well, apartheid was an extremely brutal system of complete separation and domination by the white mi minority. But by the 1980s, uh, South Africa was composed of 65% uh, people of uh, African descent, African peoples. Uh, that was like uh, 18,000 black people as opposed to 4,000, I mean, 18 million black people as opposed to 4 million white people, 3 million people of mixed race or colors that they were called or still called and uh, approximately a million people of Asian descent. And so you had this tiny minority who uh, implemented the strictest separation uh, apartheid. So they occupied 80% of the land and not just uh, any land, the most fertile land in South Africa was occupied by the white settlers. They removed, forcibly removed people from their lands and put them in what were called Bantu stands or homelands. That was 12% of the land and it was the most desolate land you could imagine. I, I've been to some of those uh, Bantu stands uh, and uh, really it, they were uninhabitable, but yet people were forced to move there. Uh, and there were uh, a series of laws that uh, made it legal to detain people without uh, any charges for months and sometimes years. Uh, the, uh, there was prohibitions against mixed race marriages. There was uh, prohibitions against uh, demonstrations. Uh, and so it was a very strict and oppressive system of racial uh, separation and racial oppression. Uh, and during the course of the anti-apartheid movement in the US, we made the parallel between apartheid in South Africa and Jim Crow in the US. Uh, and, and it really struck a chord with folks in the black community because they could see that uh, there were uh, striking similarities in the racial se separation and the oppression uh, going on in South Africa and the US. And so uh, as a young organizer during the anti-apartheid days, uh, it was uh, a focus on how we could show solidarity towards each other and understand each other's struggle. And, uh, what I found was that a ready audience among black people to understand what was going on in South Africa because it was so egregious and because it's so paralleled our experience here in the US. Yes, yes, thank you for that. So I wanna get into how you join this struggle and how you join the black freedom movement at all to begin with, and and then how you specifically decided you were gonna spend your time fighting against apartheid in a country far away. Yeah. And like why, why prioritize a struggle against racism in South Africa when we, you, you know, there's a black freedom struggle here at home going on uh, as well. And I, I also hope you can talk about you know, share some of the stories about your time at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, um, and and that Black Student Union organizing and the fight for Black studies there. Yeah, that was where, uh, in Madison, that was where I really came into political consciousness. I went there in 1966 as a freshman, the same year that the Black Panthers was founded, in the same year that Stokely Carmichael espoused black power as a uh, as a ideology and a, and a political uh, uh, and, a, and a politic, and so uh, it was a time when black students were coming into our own to try to understand who we were in the world and to demand uh, our place uh, in the United States and in and in the curriculum of universities across the country. In 1969, our student leaders 
uh, black student union leaders called for a student strike until we won black studies uh, and demands were for black studies for more black uh, professors and for more black students on campus. We struck for about eight days. Uh, we were brutally repressed by the police, by the uh, National Guard. They tear gassed us. They beat many students. They suspended in, 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 uh, uh, students. They jailed students. Uh, but yet we still won the Black Studies struggle. I just uh, feel yeah. like people need to know that history. Because like even us having this conversation right now about how do we get Black Studies going again, it's like for folks to know that it took people getting their heads cracked and tear gassed to even have this conversation, right? Yes, this was okay. going on across the country. Madison was one of over 100 universities both white institutions and black institutions that were on strike until the demands were met uh, throughout the late 60s and early 70s. And so this was a massive uh, part of the black power movement in this country. And that is what brought me to, to consciousness that social movements can make social change, that they were critical to social change. And so by the time I got to Seattle in 1973, uh, uh, I was prepared to be a part of, of, of social movements. And I ran into and met uh, who was now a good friend of mine and, and now my boss at the Othering and Belonging Institute at UC Berkeley, John Powell, who was at that time an attorney at Evergreen Legal Services. Uh, he involved me in the American Friends Service Committee, which is a Quaker, uh, peace and justice organization that's uh, national and international. And I was hired by them and I organized uh, you know, an anti-apartheid project uh, in Seattle and began my work in the anti-apartheid movement in 1977. This was the year that Steve Biko was brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. Steve Biko was the leader of the black consciousness movement that arose after the Soweto uprisings in 1976. Uh, Soweto was the uprisings in which high school and junior high school students took to the streets uh, across South Africa to protest uh, the education system, to protest the fact that uh, the Afrikaners were imposing the Afrikaans language as the primary medium of instruction in the schools. And the students knew that if they were taught in Afrikaans that they would be isolated in the world because South Africa is the only place where the language was, was uh, spoken. And so they took to the streets to, to protest that. And uh, as we were in 1969 uh, in Madison, they were met with brutal repression. Hector Peterson was the first student uh, to die, his name went down in, in history, uh, memorialized in history, and the demands began to grow. So it became to dismantle the education system, became to dismantle apartheid. And uh, that marked the beginning of the end of apartheid. The brutal repression came down. Uh, the next year, uh, Steve Biko was murdered and the movement continued. The movement continued to grow and grow and grow. And so I was uh, an organizer in Seattle during that time uh, in going to uh, community events, going to colleges, going to uh, universities and churches and private homes. Uh, and I always was met with a par what? A part, a part, a part. Can you pronounce that for me? Uh, but, but within six or seven years, apartheid became a household word, uh, both in terms of organizers like myself across the country that were doing the work that I was doing, organizing small events and large events, bringing speakers from the ANC and the PAC, African National Congress of South Africa and the Pan-Africanist Congress bringing speakers from 
all, uh, the other liberation movements from Namibia and, and uh, Angola and, and uh, Zimbabwe, uh, really making the connection with the liberation movements on the continent and our struggle in the US and, and bringing the consciousness that the struggle, as I said before, against racism and white supremacy was an international struggle and that we, we could not win the struggle at home unless we connected across the world and began to lift up our struggles as one. And so, uh, so we organized in Seattle. We had, a, we had a, a gentleman in Seattle who volunteered to be uh, the council for the South African government, the representative of the South African government in Seattle. And so we held weekly demonstrations at his house uh, for years. Every Sunday we were out there demonstrating. We'd go up to the, we'd go up the steps. Uh, the police would come and say, you're trespassing. If you don't leave, you're gonna be arrested. We tell them we're not leaving until apartheid is dismantled. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Handcuff us take us to jail uh, and, um, and then schedule us for preliminary hearing. This went on, uh, as I said, for years. At one point we had over a hundred people scheduled to go to trial. And so, uh, and we got massive publicity out of that campaign every weekend. Every, the, the demonstrations were on Sunday, we were on the Sunday news, we were in the, in both newspapers on Monday morning. We were on the Monday morning news. We were, uh, and so uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, momentum and support. And this was going on across the country. Uh, some of you who were there uh, during that time remember uh, the demonstrations that were going on at the uh, South African embassy, Randall Robinson in Trans-Africa in the Southern Africa Support Committee were organizing those demonstrations every day with uh, folks like Harry Belafonte and, uh, and uh, Stevie Wonder and Walter Fauntroy, uh, all these folks every day getting arrested at the South African embassy. That sparked the demonstrations that we had in Seattle. It sparked here in the Bay Area, the, the longshoremen refusing to unload boats. Uh, uh, they were hauling cargo from oh, South Africa. Beautiful. Uh, all over the country, people were responding to the call. Uh, at that time, this was by this time, it was 1984. And uh, coming off of the Jackson campaign, Jesse Jackson campaign for president in 1984, we went right into the anti apartheid movement. I became the co chair of the Seattle Coalition Against Apartheid. We started these demonstrations. Uh, and uh, it became uh, really a, by that time, as I said, apartheid had become a household word. And so we didn't, we moved from just strictly doing educational work to really lifting up this struggle in a way that had never been lifted up before. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. I just have a... Uh... Last question about like, um, what were some of the demands you guys raised in the struggle? And what do you think the impact of this international solidarity campaign was in the ultimate defeat of the apartheid regime? Yeah, so the, the ANC had a strategy that uh, the international movement was a critical part of. So they, they're, their slogan was make apartheid unworkable, make South Africa ungovernable. And so they had, uh, they had a, an alliance on the ground of the ANC, the uh, South African Communist Party and COSATU, the Congress of South African Trade Unions. Uh, and, uh, with, and so on the ground, they were organizing through the United Democratic Front uh, to, to implement that slogan. They, call, they called upon the international community to support their liberation through boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And so 
we organize those things, boycott, divestment, and sanctions. So we boycotted Seafirst Bank, which is now Bank of America. Seafirst was making loans to corporations in South Africa. We held a demonstration in front of their uh, headquarters and burned our, our checkbooks in, in, in protest of those loans. Uh, we called on the US government to divest from South Africa to, uh, to uh, pass a law to make corporations divest from South Africa. Uh, we, we boycotted IBM, all of these corporations that were doing business in South Africa. Uh, and so it was a very active campaign to bring the consciousness of how US corporations and the US government were supporting apartheid. And uh, Congressman Ron Dellums from the Bay Area year after year after year had, had been uh, uh, introducing the Anti-Apartheid Act. Well, in 1986, with uh, Ronald Reagan as president, uh, at that time, the most conservative president in modern history, the Anti-Apartheid Act of 1986 passed. Uh, it went to Ronald Reagan's desk and he, bought, and he vetoed it. It came back to Congress and they passed the legislation over his veto. This was due to the mass pressure that was on the ground every day from the movement in the US and across Europe and across the yeah. world and in South Africa that came together. And uh, the, the freedom movement leaders in South Africa credited the anti-apartheid movement across the world for helping and you got down and you got to meet Nelson Mandela, right? I did. You I tell people about it. Well, I you know I went to South Africa in 1984 for the election. Uh, I I was a journalist for the Oakland Tribune and for Black Scholar Magazine, and so I covered the election. I I, I uh, stayed in uh, Duncan Village, which is the second largest township in South Africa in Mandela's home province of the Eastern Cape. I worked for an ANC office during the election uh, uh, for you know, 12 hours a day working to, to uh, get the ANC and, uh, uh, elected and to get Nelson Mandela elected. And I, and I went to the inauguration and wrote about the inauguration. I didn't meet Nelson Mandela at that time. When I did meet him was uh, the first time he came to Seattle. Uh, I, I came as a journalist and as an anti-apartheid activist and was able to, uh, they flew him into Boeing Field and they allowed several of us from the anti-apartheid movement to go into a reception area to meet him and his wife, Grasa Michelle. And so we spent 20 minutes with him uh, and told him a lot of the history of what went on in Seattle and, and really... Uh, that was the highlight of my life to to meet Nelson Mandela. Such a that must have been incredible. Absolutely. So we want to come back to our topic, and I'm really curious what people remember about the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. So maybe you were a kid and you remember something, or maybe you were an organizer in the struggle. If you want to drop in the chat, um, anything you remember about that time uh that would be cool for people just to get a sense of what you uh experienced in this struggle and then to bring it full circle you know the first online people's historian class that we did was with dr jean theo harris about the rebellious life of mrs rosa parks and in our breakout room, we realized, oh yeah, there's this picture of Rosa uh, supporting the anti-apartheid struggle. And so, um, Gene, if you just wanted to talk about that real quick, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think it it really echoes what Mr. Lenoir was saying, or Jesse's dad, <laughs> what Jesse's dad was saying, which is that Mrs. Parks really saw the kind of, that there was no like, dividing line between what they were doing fighting racism here in the United States and then both the sort of struggle against um, the war in Vietnam but that also many activists even in the 
you know, even in the 60s, let alone the 70s and 80s, like Mrs. Parks, began also to look at other uh, anti-colonial struggles on the continent and then also the anti-apartheid struggles in South Africa. So she was a long-standing kind of uh, activist uh, against um, apartheid and against US investment in apartheid. And then Deborah just put in the chat um, a photo of her uh, like Mr. Lenoir was saying, there were these constant protests outside the South African embassy. And so she's there with those. So, yeah. And then it's in the YA book too. The picture's in the YA book and in the, in the regular book. Right on. I mean, that's so beautiful to just think about how Rosa helped spark this massive uprising in the U.S. and then sees how important it is to be part of the struggle internationally is exactly, I think, what we were talking about to kick this this whole session off. Um, thank you for sharing that. So I have a couple questions uh, more and maybe other people have questions that they wanna throw in the chat too. But I love seeing all these remembrances of where people were during this struggle and, and things they remember. Um, Gil Scott Heron's song, What's the Word, Johannesburg? Yes. Um, I that was quite an inspiration on the ground, I tell you, both in U.S. and South Africa. What, what kind of car were you rolling when you were bumping that? <laughs> I, I had a hoopty, man. It was... <laughs> All right. The real... Yes, Kayla, yes. Yes. Somebody you uh, no doubt no doubt um, there, was a, there was a song called free nelson mandela by the soweto singers that was also very popular during the time free nelson mandela it was it was hyping us up i tell you excellent yeah and uh miriam makiba Yes, Miriam. Someone said they have a friend named after her. Oh, cool. Oh, Sweet Honey and the Rock has oh, a song yeah. called Biko. Is that right? I haven't heard that one. Oh, yeah, man. That was that was very strong song, too. Yeah. Here comes Stephen Biko. Yep. All right. Excellent. Well, um, I have a couple questions and then maybe other people have some some questions too, but I love that people threw the playlist in there because I think starting these <laughs> lessons off in your classroom with the music could grab their attention, right? And then um, talk of then dissecting the lyrics and getting into the history might be a great way to introduce this in the classroom. Um, and then I also think that we need to make this history relevant to our students' lives today, right? So that it's not just a history lesson, but it's a guide to action today. And so uh, I wanna start with talking about uh, why this is important to Black Lives Matter activists today, why the fight for racial justice here in the US um, needs to know about the fight against apartheid in South Africa. Yeah, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter movement is on it. They've already, the leaders in that movement, uh, a lot of them have a consciousness of the struggle against racism and white supremacy is international. Uh, one of the reasons is that Opal Tometi, who you, Jesse, you've met and have worked with. Yeah. Opal yeah. Tometi. Uh, she wrote the foreword for Black Lives Matter at School Book, right? Yeah. And thanks so, to you introducing us. Yeah. So Opal comes from a family of Nigerian immigrants. She was born and raised in, in Phoenix. Uh, I was the founding director of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and hired Opal as our national organizer. And when I left the organization in 2014, Opal became the uh, executive director. She was one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter and brought to that movement and, and to that grouping an understanding and, and a consciousness around uh, Pan-Africanism and the need to unite uh, African-Americans 
with our brothers and sisters across the diaspora, both in the U.S. and across the world. And so uh, that, uh, that is so critical to understanding. Opal is still working on, in the international realm to bring uh, folks, from, particularly from the continent, uh, into dialogue and, and struggle with folks in the U.S., and so, uh, and that's then, right. She has a new organization. Yeah. Uh, Diaspora Rising, I believe it's called. Is that right? That is right. And uh, if you go diasporarising.org, you can, you can uh, connect to her uh, newsletter that comes out and some of the work that she's doing. And so, uh, and then there's another group called Africans Rising, which is a network uh, on the African continent across, I don't know how many countries that is doing work in linking the struggles on the African continent and bringing uh, to bear the weight of all of the activism on the continents on critical issues uh, facing folks on the continent. And so uh, some of the folks from Black Lives Matter are also connected in that network. And, uh, and so uh, I think it's really important that we confront an international system with an international organizing strategy. Uh, and really the crux of it is the anti-Black racism in the world that is the foundational uh, relationship uh, for white supremacy. And so, uh, so I think it's really critical for us to bring that to our students, for them to understand uh, their connection to the continent uh, and, and to create a new Pan-African identity. What is happening in this country is that the, the fastest growing part of the, the black community is migration from particularly the African continent and from the Caribbean. And that's creating sometimes friction within our communities because the powers that be are playing us one off against each other. So uh, for example, quote unquote, affirmative action slots, they often give to African immigrants uh, and as a way to divide and conquer us, to, to, to drive a wedge between us. Same thing happening in corporate America. And so uh, it's really important for us to develop that kind of uh, consciousness that says, uh, we're in this, we have this same struggle against a system uh, that has created colonialism and neo-colonialism uh, throughout the world and created uh, systems of oppression in this country. And so uh, part of the work that I was doing in the Black Alliance for Just Immigration and the Pan-African Network uh, was to uh, foster that kind of Pan-African identity through through what we call African diaspora dialogues, where we bring people from the diaspora, from the, what we call the old diaspora, those of us of, of slave, uh, our ancestors who were enslaved in the new diasporas, the folks that came after us, trying to bring those groups together to create dialogues about what is it that's dividing us? What is it that, that we can come together around? How do we create this new identity? Yeah, no, I love that work that you have done for years, bringing together African immigrants with with African American folks here, and even with, um, you know, border solidarity work with with Mexican immigrants and yeah. Latinx immigrants. Yeah, that's yeah. such important solidarity work. Yeah, and I think uh, you know we have a tendency to think that uh, the struggle on the continent uh, is over because colonialism is in has ended, but <laughs> it's far from over. Corporations are pillaging and plundering the uh, the countries of the African continent, uh, and uh, it is our corporations and European corporations that are doing this, and so we have a responsibility. Uh, to make sure that uh, we connect our struggles because those same corporations are the ones that are, <laughs> are 
oppressing us here in the U.S. And so uh, I, I think uh, we need to uh, really look at that and understand those connections. Yeah, no doubt. And there's uprisings that we can stand with, like in Nigeria, um, yes. that are important to support. In Nigeria, when, when George Floyd was murdered, uh, they started demonstrations against their own police, uh, against police brutality in Nigeria. It, it really sparked a huge movement in Nigeria. Uh, same thing in England, same thing in France. And so... Um, there's so much good stuff going on in the chat. And I just want to highlight for people that we do have a lot of curriculum on teaching about South, South African apartheid, specifically a lot of lessons that Bill Bigelow created. And maybe, um, Bill, if you're there, if you want to just quickly say some of the resources that you would point people to. Sure, thanks, Jesse. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have we have three pieces at the uh, at the Zen Education Project. One is a book I did that came out in 1985 called Strangers in Their Own Country, which um, became the kind of the main anti-apartheid curriculum. It was distributed by Trans Africa and the American Committee on Africa. And, you know, a lot of the solidarity movement was banned in South Africa. Um, and uh, so there's still a lot of lessons in there, I think, that are valuable, um, including one that is uh, really critical of the role that, that U.S. investment played in South Africa. One of the things I think it's important to remember uh, is that uh, that there's no alignment between investment, U.S. investment, and uh, progress. That the worst years of repression in South Africa also saw the greatest amount of U.S. direct investment in South Africa, and so those lined up. So there's that book that that uh, you might uh, take a look at, and the entire book is as a PDF at the um, at the Zen Education Project. Someone also in the chat mentioned the wonderful video, uh, Sun City, which uh, is also really worth using with students, not just because it's a great song, but here are musicians that came together from around the United States, really around the world. There were South African musicians as well at great risk um, to say, don't play Sun City. Sun City was a place in the so-called uh, homeland of Bopudatswana that South Africa was using to say, look, you know, you can come here, it's integrated, it's all fine and wonderful, and uh, to offer legitimacy to the system of apartheid. And so, and people like even Tina Turner played, uh, and uh, Rod Stewart, and so they were attracting all kinds of big names, and once uh, Little Steven and Bruce Springsteen and Run DMC and so many others uh, uh, participated in the, in the, um, in this, uh, video to boycott Sun City, people stopped, uh, you know, it was a very, very effective, uh, gesture. And then finally, uh, there's a, a, a an activity, a, a booklet on the, um, the film Witness to Apartheid that includes a role play on student activism in South Africa. I see, uh, that, um, uh, Mr. Lenoir is back with us, and so I won't take up any more time, but uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to, to share those resources, Jesse. Yeah, that worked out, because I'm really glad you could share all those great resources, and everybody should check those out for sure. And I'm glad you found a computer that's working. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I had to switch computers. No worries because uh, I have a last question that I think is really critical for us to grapple with today in terms of the importance of the movement against apartheid in South Africa, and that's the movement against apartheid in Palestine, right? Mm -hmm. and Human Rights Watch just released a report calling it apartheid. And this shirt that I'm wearing right now is not from the South African struggle. This is, I got this shirt in the West Bank 
how, you know, you and I went on a trip in 2011. It was a civil rights delegation of veterans of the civil rights movement who were going to uh, learn about the parallels to struggles in the US and South Africa and, um, you know, learn more about the struggle. So uh, I wonder if you can talk about the importance of understanding what's happening in Palestine and the parallels to, to South Africa. Yeah. As you said, Jesse, I, I've been there twice, once in 2008, and then with, I led this delegation that you were on in 2011. And uh, it was really striking to me the similarities between the systems in Palestine and Israel and in South Africa, uh, the dispossession of land, uh, taking the best land, uh, the, the past system. I was on a, on a public bus with some of the folks uh, and what we witnessed was a Palestinian, uh, guards got on the bus with semi-automatic rifles, three of them, approaching every Palestinian on the bus and asking for their papers. One of the Palestinians did, apparently did not have the right papers. And so they took him off the bus. The guy that was with us said he could, he could be released the next day, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. Nobody knows. Once you get arrested, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we witnessed people lining up uh, through metal detectors to get into uh, to, uh, the city to go to work, to Jerusalem to go to work. Uh, uh, I witnessed in Hebron, uh, one of the Palestinian attorneys who we were meeting get accosted again by a by an Israeli soldier with a semi-automatic rifle because he knew that he was an activist. And I watched this uh, very tense uh, exchange between the two of them. Uh, and we believe that the only reason why it didn't escalate is because there was a crew uh, from, I believe, Sweden who was filming the whole encounter. And so uh, I was in Hebron and, and and saw uh, the apartments that were uh, taken over by Israeli settlers uh, in, uh, in the, and went through the market there above the market where the uh, Palestinians were selling their wares in the market. Above them was the apartments that they used to live in. And they had a netting across the top of it because the Israeli settlers would throw garbage down on the Palestinians. That, that was one of the most shocking parts of the trip for me when, when we went and saw the from the Israeli settlers' point of view and heard their their um, yeah. tour that they gave us, and then yeah. we went below and we saw this net that was covering up this this row of shops and and heard about how they would throw garbage and then acid and yeah yeah it, I'll never forget that so it is it is not an exaggeration uh, that apartheid lives in Israel and Palestine uh, the the settlements in the West Bank uh, are, uh, are there to try to make the two state solution uh, impossible. They continue to grow. I, I stayed in a village, Belin. We stayed in a village called Belin, where they had uh, the Israeli government had uh, walled off the the vineyards that the Palestinians uh, work in to make a living. Had walled it off and are creating a wall. There was one ex. There was one entrance in and out of this village. They sealed off all the rest of it. Uh, and above the village is where the Israeli settlers were so that they could look down on the village and have an advantage point if any, if any trouble started. The roads, apartheid roads, where there were some roads that if you had the wrong license plate, if you had Palestinian license plate, 
then you could not be on that road. You would be arrested immediately for traveling on that road. And so the the parallels were yeah, so striking. Yeah, and the striking. wall, right? In the wall, the apartheid wall. Talk about wall. the wall. Yeah, huge wall. That wall snaked through. There was no, the wall does not comport to the boundaries that were settled in terms of uh, where the Palestinian state would be. What it does follow is where the water is. So they blocked off uh, water resources from Palestinian villages. And so uh, uh, the international cry is beginning to, uh, to bubble up now. And this has been a long time struggle. You know, SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, passed a resolution in support of Palestinian rights in the 60s. Similarly, members of Black Lives Matter also made trips to Palestine, you know, creating solidarity groups in support of uh, Palestinian human rights. And so it's really critical in, that we understand the way that, uh, that Palestine resembles South Africa. And in fact, during the anti-apartheid era, South Africa uh, was one of the apartheid regime's greatest allies. They helped them get nuclear capability. They provided them with arms and training uh, and, and it continues. Yeah, thank you. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to wrap this conversation up. Really appreciate the time you getting to share all this with with everybody else is special for me. And um, I dropped a link in the chat to an interview I did with Aaron Dixon about um, how the Black Panther Party supported Palestine and uh, Palestinian liberation. And there's also this awesome new children's or young, young adult book called Determined to Stay, Palestinian Youth Fight for Their Village that makes the connection with Black struggle here at home for youth to see that I'd recommend educators use to introduce this topic and the connections to Palestine as well from, uh, from Jody. So thank you everybody for being here. We have an evaluation link that we hope you will all take the time right now to click on. If you can uh, click on that, uh, I'd be grateful if you can start to uh, fill out that form. And if you want to unmute yourself and say thank you to my dad, that would be awesome. Thank, thank you, you so much. Mr. Lenoir. Thank you, Pops. Thank you. Mr. Lenoir. Hey, thank, thank you, you for yeah. the opportunity to be with my son. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to hang out for the afternoon. That's pretty yeah. cool. No, I enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you all bring these lessons into the classroom. It's, it's such an important thing. One you. quick thing. I was at a party uh, in, in Detroit with a bunch of people from Seattle, this young man from Seattle, young black man who had written his, his thesis on South Africa. I said, do you know anything about the anti-apartheid movement in Seattle? He'd never heard of it. Hmm. He'd never heard of it. Our general, we're losing our history. We need to bring it to the classroom. I appreciate all of you for doing that.